success of our movement. What's the greatest thing, the only good thing about Rocky Flats? It's shut. We shut it. People from the Rocky Mountain Truth Force sitting on those railroad tracks year after year after year. Tremendously brilliant, effective, nonviolent movement. And unfortunately, there were people living downwind. And Kristen was one of them. And she wrote this amazing book. I have looked through it. Uh, I did a lot of work on Rocky Flats. We had a chapter on Rocky Flats in uh, Killing Our Own, with, which Bob Alvarez, and Bob Alvarez is not here tonight. I want to acknowledge Bob Alvarez, by the way. He one of the great um, real forces in, 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 in movement. And did I see, yes, David Freeman back there? Yeah. David Freeman is here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Kristen has written this incredible book. Uh, she is an actual writer. She's an English, a PhD in English, uh, which I highly recommend doing. <laughs> and uh, and, and is, is a, the head of the MFA program at Memphis, Memphis University. But this book is very powerful. She's making a very uh, important book tour. That she's selling books out there. And so without further ado, Kristen Iverson, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me here tonight. And I can't say I was moved to tears when I heard that uh, that Manhattan uh, park didn't go through today. Thank God. <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things that I hope will never happen is that the Rocky Flats so-called National Wildlife Refuge, which is more of a cover-up than clean-up, uh, I hope that never ever opens to the public. It's closed, but it's not safe. Um, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about uh, who I am and why I wrote this book, and then I thought I would just read very briefly from uh, from the opening chapter, actually. Uh, as you know, um, there's an intimate connection between nuclear weapons and nuclear power. I grew up next to Rocky Flats. Uh, our first house was about seven miles from the plant, and our second house, we moved up, <laughs> so to speak, and moved to one of the new subdivisions out there, so our house was about three miles from the plant. I spent my entire childhood, adolescence, young adulthood uh, in, in near Rocky Flats. Um, as you all know, there was extensive radioactive and toxic contamination in the environment. We had no idea. We had no idea in my neighborhood that because the plant was operated by Dow Chemical, the rumor in my neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. My mother thought they were making scrubbing bubbles. <laughs> they were not making scrubbing bubbles. They were making more than 70,000 plutonium pits for nuclear weapons, and we, we did not know. Later, like many of the kids in my neighborhood, I went to work at Rocky Flats myself. Uh, and it was the night that I came home from work. Um, I mentioned this earlier today at the rally. I uh, came home from work and put my two kids to bed and turned on the television and saw a Nightline expose on Rocky Flats. Mark Silverman, the Department of Energy Manager that I work for out there, was talking about how there were more than 14 tons of plutonium at Rocky Flats, most of it unsafely stored. That was the night that I, that was the night that I knew I would quit, and the day that I quit was the day that I knew I would write a book. Um, and I want to emphasize again what a profound impact uh, activism has had at Rocky Flats over the years and uh, to the present day. They're building houses right next to Rocky Flats. Um, there are no signs out there. We've worked so hard to try to get signs out there. People who buy houses out there or go, you know, they're putting up shopping malls. There's incredible development out there. And people do not know that um, that entire site is contaminated and 1,300 acres of the site are so profoundly contaminated that they can never, ever be open to the public. Um, so, <laughs> What I wanted to read to you from, uh, just a little bit from this opening chapter, is something that happened in 1969. Uh, as, as many of you know, there were um, lots of problems at Rocky Flats. Over the years, there were more than 200 fires. The two biggest fires were in 1957, the year before I was born, and 1969, the year that we moved out to our new house and we moved closer to the plant. On this particular day, May 11th, 1969, um, there was a huge fire in the plutonium processing building and a radioactive cloud traveled over the city of Denver. Contamination was found uh, as far away as 30 miles, plutonium contamination, 30 miles from the plant. We didn't learn this until 1970, uh, years, years after it happened. Um, if you're interested on my website, there's a map based on Department of Energy information that shows the plume that, uh, you know, that traveled over Denver. While this was going on, my family, like many of the families in the area, we were having Mother's Day brunch. 
We had no idea what was going on. There was no warning, no evacuation, nothing. I want to read to you just uh, very briefly from a section um, in this opening chapter. And uh, this is, uh, I was very fortunate, this book took 10 years of research and writing. And uh, I just, the, there are two guys in this opening chapter, um, Stan Skinger and Bill Dennison. I was able to um, have interviews with both of these guys. They're not uh, firefighters, they're guards. And they showed up to work on this particular day on Mother's Day. They showed up at the gate and they said, don't go to your regular uh, duty. We want you to go down to the plutonium processing building because we have a little problem. And so this, that's, this is where it starts. When they arrive on the east side of the plutonium processing building, it looks quiet and clean, at least from the outside. There's a loading dock with doors on each side and a set of double doors that leads into an interior hallway. The men pull on their masks and strap on their air tanks. CO2 only, Bill says, no water. Stan nods. They open the door, move into the hallway and enter the main production area. Holy cow. Stan stops in his tracks. Usually as bright as a supermarket, the room is nearly pitch black. A few emergency lights glow dully. The only noise comes from the fans feeding a fire he can feel more than see. I can't even see my hand in front of my face, he mutters. Smoke rolls toward them in waves. Bill sees the orange glow and moves closer. It looks like the flames are shooting up over the glove boxes. You know, glove boxes are the boxes which the workers manipulated the plutonium triggers. One, two, three glove boxes. No, all of them. He knows the look of this kind of fire. It reminds him of forest fires he's seen in films, high, fast-moving flames, but the color is different. It's the distinct, unearthly brilliance of burning metal. What is that, Stan yells? Plutonium. Probably the magnesium carriers, too. The heat is intense. Stan feels it through his mask. It's not just the plutonium, he yells. It's the plastic, the shielding. It's the Benelux around those glove boxes. Benelux doesn't burn. It's burning. Why is it burning? The plexiglass, too, Bill shouts. The plexiglass is on fire. It takes a lot of radiant heat to make something like that flammable, Stan thinks. This fire has been going on for a while. Burning globes crash from the ceiling. It's hard to tell whether they're just light fixtures or pendants, the baskets that carry plutonium nuggets down the production line. Come on, Stan says. Time is short. He knows this building. Both men have walked it hundreds of times, upstairs and down. The two buildings are connected. The 776 side has two floors. 777 has one. Protecting the roof of 777 is crucial. The plenums, the filters, stretch across the entire roof area. Stan likes to compare a plenum to the air filter on a car. With a car, you clean the air before you pull it into the engine. In a plutonium processing building, you clean the air in the building before you blow it out into the atmosphere. The flow is reversed from inside to outside. If the fire burns through the plenums on the 777 roof, massive amounts of plutonium, as well as other contaminants and radioactive material, will spread over the Denver area and beyond. Stan opens, opens a cabinet and finds a stack of hard hats. He hands one to Bill and straps one on himself. Where are the other firefighters, he wonders. They're unaware of the Jesser team, and this is a small team that was coming in from the other side of the building. The men inch into the room until they find the buckets of sand set in corners for extinguishing small fires. They move toward the edge of the fire and throw sand on the flames. It's like throwing grains of rice in the face of an oncoming locomotive. The fire continues to grow. Bill grabs a CO2 canister and hands another to Stan. They fire them into the glove boxes. It has little effect. They empty another canister. The, room in, the air in the room is unbearably hot and the men are breathing heavily. Already they're almost out of air. The fire gallops through the line. What now, Stan yells. Bill yells something back, but Stan can't hear it. What are, the, what are they supposed to do? Who are they supposed to ask? They're alone. The no water rule is the only rule they've got, but it's useless. The men bolt out of the building, shaken and gasping. They change tanks and confer briefly, ignoring the radiation monitor who's carefully chalked off a square area. Don't step outside these lines, he barks. Keep the contamination inside these lines, as if plutonium could possibly recognize a line of chalk. Water? Bill looks to stand for confirmation. Water. 
what the hell Stan thinks. He's not a firefighter, he's a guard. He's lived in the country and nearly all he knows about firefighting is how to beat a prairie grass fire with a burlap sack. You good with these things? He asks Bill. More or less, Bill replies. They wrestle with the nozzle. Use the fine spray. Got it. Soft, gentle like, Bill says. Hit the gases from the melting plastic first. See what happens. Okay. They re-enter the building, this time with water hoses. We'll take turns going forward, Bill says. I spray you, then you spray me. We need to keep each other cooled down. Let's head toward the center, Stan says. Get under the center beams and see how the plenum looks. Okay. Bill turns his hose on Stan, and Stan moves forward into the smoke, trying to follow the emergency lighting on the floor. Hey, Bill yells. Stan looks back. Don't blow any of those plutonium pieces together. Keep them separated. I know. Blue flash. He knows. Working in tandem, Bill and Stan move along the glove box line, directing the spray of water around the flames and then on each other. They've gone only a few feet when they see where the real fire lies in the foundry area, where plutonium is melted and cast into pieces carried to the production line. The foundry line is 100 feet long and contains eight furnaces, all held inside glove boxes. The entire line is ablaze. Bill curses. The men glance at each other. The production area is tight. There's only one way to get to the foundry area, through the underpasses. Some glove boxes have steps beneath them, tiny stairs going down to a miniature basement with steps leading up the other side. This allows workers to get from one side of the production line to the other. The underpasses have no drains. Anything that spills under a glove box is contaminated and has to be cleaned up, not flushed out. There's no place for the water to go, and the underpasses are filled with water. The water is rising. It's like a sheep dip, Bill says, and laughs. He thinks back to all the ranches he worked on as a kid. One hell of a sheep dip. There's our criticality, Bill, Stan says. We're looking right at it. Who's going in? Both men stand silent. Bill looks up and sees an elevator flipped upside down, the supporting metal scorched and twisted. People are going to get killed tonight, and he thinks it might be him and Stan. He thinks of his wife and his two other kids. Both men were trained for the battlefield, but it didn't prepare them for this. One thing it did teach them was to keep their feelings to themselves and move. Bill wades in. The water is up to his knees. He thinks he's moving fast, but it feels slow. He prays they haven't knocked any plutonium pits or pieces into the water, which could lead to the criticality they fear. Then he's up the other side, and the foundry fire is so hot, so immediate, that his soaked coveralls dry instantly. His face feels scorched beneath his mask. Stan is right behind him. They spray the fire until their air runs low a few short minutes. Then they drop their hoses, wade through the sheep dip again, and fight their way back to the door. A radiation monitor is waiting when they burst from the building and yank off their masks. He checks their hands. You're hot, man, coated. His sharpness can't hide his fear. You can't go back in. We're all right, Bill says. No, you're off the chart. We gotta go back. Stan reaches for a fresh tank. The plenum's about to go. At this point, the roof of this building is rising like a marshmallow bubble. Um, it's just about to break. Are you gonna keep us out here so we can all watch the roof melt? I'm serious, you guys are not going back in that building. Who else is there, Bill asks. We're waiting on more guys, another monitor yells. We don't have anyone else yet. We don't even have enough gear. We're waiting for Boulder and Broomfield to bring more tanks. The only manager on duty that the men are aware of is the guard captain who's on the phone. Is that you, George? Stan peers into the man's mask. He recognizes him from the lunchroom. They're both model railroad hobbyists. I can't let you back in, Stan, George says. Come on, what the hell are you guys thinking? He looks toward the road. A van is on the way to take workers to building 559 for decontamination. George, Stan says, we let the fire get into the plenums and Denver is screwed. Give us the tanks. Bill's voice is furious. Can't do that. Then we'll just take them, Stan says. They strap on the tanks and pull on their masks as George, arms folded, blocks their way. Bill shoves past him. Stan follows. The men duck back into the building. I'll go first this time, Stan shouts. He runs, crouching into the production line. He darts back and forth, spraying anything that doesn't look like plutonium. That man is as quick as a monkey, Bill thinks. 
After a few minutes, he sprays him down and they switch. Bill can't move quite as quickly as Stan, but it feels like they're making progress. They're both thinking about the roof. I'm out, Bill shouts, and gestures toward his tank. Stan nods and wonders if the heat and exertion are causing them to go through their air tanks more quickly than usual, or if the tanks are only partially filled. Abruptly, Stan is knocked to the floor, flat on his back, covered with debris. He can't see anything. He doesn't lose consciousness, but it takes him a moment to realize that his body is covered with a heavy material, ceiling material. His heart pounds. The roof, this is it, he thinks. The roof is gone. It's over. But nothing happens. He looks up to see Bill still standing. He finds he can move his arms and legs, so he sits up and looks around. He's covered with gunk, messy, sticky gunk, and he pulls a soggy piece off his arm. Bill points to a gap in the ceiling, a false ceiling made of fiber material in two foot by three foot sections. They've sprayed it repeatedly with their hoses and the tiles have collapsed from the weight of the water. Stan is covered with nothing more than soaked ceiling tiles. The roof is still intact. He stands up and Bill cleans him off. He can't read Bill's face. Outside, they explode with laughter. I hate to admit it, Stan says, but I think that's the closest I've ever come to shitting my pants. The statement strikes them both as hilarious, and they switch to new tanks. I'm going to skip up, and I'm just going to read you just a little bit at the end so you get a sense of, of what happened at the end of this fire and how incredibly close we came. And of course, if, if this event had ended differently, I would not be standing in front of you today. Bill Dennison's arms and legs are heavy with exhaustion. Stan, too, is tired. A relief crew of firefighters has arrived at the west side of the building where Jesser and his crew are working, but there's no one to relieve the two guards. They both figure they had the last of their bad luck when the ceiling fell. They survived wading through the sheep dips. The fire, if not diminishing, at least is not growing. The worst is over, must be over, if they can just hang on a little longer. It's Stan's turn to go ahead. Their tanks are getting low and Bill is misting Stan, keeping him cool. Stan stoops down to pick up his hose. It looks like it's charred on one side, but still usable. He turns it on, but it's too hard, too fast, and it shoots out on full steam. No good, he thinks. He wants to wet down the material, not blow it around. He tries to turn the valve and slow it down, but it's still too much. He shuts it all the way off and the hose goes from full pressure to no pressure. Suddenly, the backed up water bursts through the side of the hose. It catches his mask and pulls it off. The burning air hits his face full force. The hose flails around him like a wild snake. Stan tries to think clearly. Get the mask back on, he thinks. Don't breathe. Where is the strap? The strap catches on his nose. Everything is out of place. 30 seconds pass and he's still holding his breath. His fingers fumble through the heavy gloves. Another 30 seconds. He thinks of all the crud they use in there. Plastics, vinyl, rubber paints, carbon tetrachloride, cleaning chem chemicals, Benelux and plexiglass, oh, and plutonium. He needs air. He can't help it. He knows he shouldn't breathe, but he has to. He takes one big gulp and holds it. He keeps holding it another minute at least until he gets the mask pulled back on. Bill pulls him around. You okay? Stan exhales into his mask and nods. I'm okay. They go back for new tanks. One more run, they think. They can do at least one more. But Bill's bad luck isn't over yet either. The men finish their air and head for the door. As they're crossing the floor, a blazing fluorescent light fixture crashes from the ceiling, nearly knocking off Bill's hard hat. He staggers, dazed. His oxygen tank is empty. He can't breathe, and he's lost stand in the smoke and the dark. A man, another guard, appears. Bill recognizes him, Charlie Parisi. He's come off the roof to help relieve Stan and Bill. Charlie's a small man, shorter than Bill, but he pulls Bill up on his shoulders and brings him out into the air. They're all contaminated. Charlie has kept his mask on, but he smells smoke. The same smoke Stan experienced, but somehow it's gotten inside his mask. The fire is now, but it's more or less under control, and the men stagger to the van that will take him to decon. For the citizens of Colorado, Luck plays a big role on the afternoon of Mother's Day, May 11th, 1969. There are three lucky breaks, all largely the result of human error. 
The first stroke of luck occurred earlier in the week when workers accidentally left behind a metal plate that blocks the North Guelph box line. This plate forces the racing fire to turn from building 777, a single story building with an extremely vulnerable roof that probably would have collapsed immediately to building 776. 776 has a second story and is a little less susceptible. This buys time. The second lucky break occurs when a member of the other team, Jesser's team, tries to hose a burning pile of plutonium into a corner. Burning plutonium turns into a heavy sludge of plutonium oxide ash, as heavy as wet cement. The pile won't move. Later, an AEC fire investigator will report that if the firemen had been successful in moving the sludge and pushing pieces of plutonium together, a criticality would have been the inevitable result. The third piece of luck is the most important, and is nothing short of deja vu for Bill Dennison, who also fought the 1957 fire. This exact same thing happened in 1957. A flustered fireman inadvertently backs a fire truck into a power pole adjacent to the building. Just as in 1957, an accidental power cutoff occurs, and just in the nick of time. The fans, which have been sucking the fire into the filter bank, feeding it and causing the roof to melt, stop spinning. The fire still burns, but more slowly, the roof holds. Wow. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> and, um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for all the good work that you do, and please, let's not ever let anything like this happen again. And companies will not tell us the truth about when things like this happen.